Well, we should probably get started, right? Now, there was a for those of you who actually did show up on time. We should probably start. You're welcome to boo anyone who comes in late. That's permitted. You're allowed to do that. And uh, unless you think a lot of people are going to come, right? it's too long. She's on time. She doesn't get booed. Why? Why? Thanks. Good morning. Oh, hi. Oh, really well, thanks. This is so blurry. Ugh. Okay, we'll see how we do. Everyone have coffee? Everyone ready? Settle in, strap in. This is not going to be exciting, I promise. But it's going to be really useful. That's, uh, I don't know that that's a big selling feature, but we try, right? Um, my name's Chris. I'm from a company called Protect Your Boundaries. How many of you guys have come to seminars that I've done here before? You have been here. Um, this is this seminar is called How to Read and Use a Survey Plan in Real Estate, and uh, it's part of a six-part seminar series that covers everything from title insurance and how it really works to uh, easements and right of ways to boundary disputes, everything that has to do with a house that you're selling or buying, but the boundary, the extent, the type. One of the things that I love to to just continue to remind myself of, and you guys too, is the fact that never forget that even though your client is, is incredibly interested and falling in love with the house, what's actually being transacted is land at the end of the day. It just happens to have a building on it. But it's actually land that gets the land that is being transacted. And so because of that, it's really important to not forget about how big that piece of land is, where it ends, where it starts, where it ends, where the next piece of land starts. And where this piece of land ends and the next piece of land starts is the boundary. And so to not be fully aware of where those boundaries are of a property and to not be able to represent a property with absolute certainty as what the accepted title is, puts you and your client, whether you're on the listing side or the buying side, at risk. And it's at risk for you in terms of being accused of not representing it, not, not disclosing it properly, misrepresenting information. If you're on the buying side, you put your client at risk of buying something and ending up with something that actually isn't what they thought they bought. There's all kinds of ramifications for that. So, oh, here we go. A few more. Hi, how are you? Come on in. It's inevitable. You start the intro, and that's what you're showing. So, I'm just going to grab this door. So today, what we're going to talk about is how to read and use a survey plan in real estate. Um, it's a really simple set of instructions I'm going to give you today. And it's going to be broken down into two parts. We'll get to a demo in a second, to into an example in a second. It's going to be broken down into two parts. It was so important for you guys to pick up on. I promise you. But going through this, and if you apply everything you learned today, then it isn't going to add more than 20 minutes to an entire transaction. But it is going to add an invaluable level of risk management and risk avoidance to you and your clients. <coughs> and so the reward out of this, in terms of uh, relative to the investment you put in, is really, really high. Good morning. So. Let's start off with an example. Have any of you seen this example from me before? I don't think so. I love this one. It's one of my favorite ones. And you're going to say to me it's an outrageous example. That never happens. Trust me. It happens all the time. So this is a beautiful property out of the East End. It's actually, I think, with the Ajax area. Um, and uh, we have a, oh, we do have a point here. Yeah. So Queen Street here, a beautiful mansion there. Oh, it's gorgeous. Gorgeous. You don't, do you live there? Does anyone live here? No? Okay, good. Did anyone buy this or sell this recently? I need to know because you need to leave. <laughs> Not really. Right. Um, uh, and uh, as you see here, there's a nice big pool in the backyard with some poured concrete and uh, all kinds of beautiful features around it. A huge great garage for, I don't know, these are seven cars in there, I think. Whatever. I don't know. But what's important here is that what I've done on here, and this is just in PowerPoint, putting a line. This isn't a precise boundary. What I'm trying to show here is that. If we were to show up to this property and just take a look, we would assume that the boundary is where the tree line is. 
because the tree line goes down the side, all the way from here, all the way down the side, and all the way across the back and down to here. And you look at it and you say, okay, that's probably the boundary. You ask the owner, where's the boundary? It's not where the trees are, it's obvious, right? And so if you proceed with this thing in this manner, you are proceeding just a visual inspection of what, where the boundary is, and you are making assumptions based on what you see and what you're being told by the owner. That's a really dangerous thing to do. So, just so you know, the reason why we know this one really, really well is that uh, our client is the developer. Oh, our client was the developer who bought the school to turn it into townhouse. And so when we surveyed this, when we surveyed this property, we realized it was a property. So let's dig into the issue. There's the property. Again, the street now is up at the top there. Here's the back. And, uh, oh, no, please. I don't want to do this. Here's a survey. I don't expect you can probably see that, but nonetheless. Um, here's a survey of the back of that property. What we're actually looking at is a zoom in of this area here on the survey. And what's interesting about this is as we start highlighting things, you'll get the idea in a second. But it's a topographic survey, so it shows some specific trees. Right there, what it's showing us is the trees across the back. And what it's also telling us is that inside that tree line is actually a fence. So if the owner says, oh, I never knew that that was the boundary. I know it was pillar stuff. No, no, no. They put a fence in there. They actually declared that to be the boundary. Um, there's a fence inside that. And so that's the pool, OK? That's the outline of the pool. And one of the things we're going to learn today is that the thick, dark line is always the boundary. And anything inside that boundary is part of the property. And anything outside that boundary is not. It doesn't matter what the seller tells you. It doesn't matter what the listing agent tells you. It doesn't matter what the lawyer tells you. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what anyone says. If it's not inside that thick, dark line, it is not part of the property. So if you're representing this as the entire property, including all the way back to the trees, you've got a problem. If somebody buys that representation, you've got a problem. If your client is buying this property, you've got a problem because the boundary cuts right through the swimming pool. When we look at this now, because that's not part of the property in fact. When we look at it like this, that's what it looks like. The red piece is actually not part of the property. And so if your client said to you, you know what, you want to move out of the city, you want to move east, you still want to be on the GO train line to be able to get into Toronto, but you know what, find us a beautiful, a beautiful estate property with a pool in the backyard. And you go, I'm on it. I'm your person. I'm your agent. I'm on it. And you find this, and you convince them that this is a good buy, it's a good price, it's just what they need, and they go and buy it. And then they find out when the school gets, because when the school gets sold to the developer, true story by the way, and the developer says, you're on our land, we want to reclaim our land here. Imagine how that buyer feels about their agent now. I would say, please, just go find this. I don't have time. I'm like working on Bay Street. I don't have time for this stuff. You're a professional. Go find your place. Imagine the repercussions. Imagine what happens to your reputation in that one client's eyes in this particular case. Not to speak of the potential for um, a lawsuit or a lawsuit or having to deal with a title insurance claim after the fact. This is so prevalent. You might say, come on, this is a swimming pool. Nobody loves swimming pools over the property line. You would be amazed. How many swimming pools in the GTA are built without purpose? Because don't forget, the builder doesn't care where he puts it. The builder is not responsible for making sure it's inside the boundary. You as the homeowner are responsible to tell the builder where you want it. It's your responsibility to make sure that pool's inside the boundary, the pool, the deck, whatever it is, the addition, the driveway, the curb, whatever you're building, it's your responsibility. So that's an example of why this is important. Because by the way, if you bought that plan, it would have cost you $298. You would have seen it right away after today. And you would have gone, there's an issue here. If you're on the listing side, you sit down with your client and go, what gives us the back here? Do you know about this? We can't represent this. The boundary right, it runs right through the pool. What, what do we do about this? And there's all kinds of remedial action you can take on it before you, before, you, um, before you list. On the buying side, you get that survey even before you put the bid in. Please, never put a bid in on a house with a pool unless you get a survey that shows that the pool is actually inside property lines. 
So how did that was solved? So it was solved, good question. The way it was solved is the developer here in their plans, they were good guys. They decided that they would change their plans so that they wouldn't have to take this land, right? Now, they do own this land, but what they did is they granted this owner an easement over this portion of land so that they wouldn't have to rip out the pool and all the rest of it. So they granted the, uh, they, this, the owner of this property granted an easement to this landowner for this piece of land. That was a really fortunate outcome for these guys. Most developers, especially ones here like the city, no way. Absolutely not. Now, that easement cost a ton of money. These guys paid heavily for it. But nonetheless, they didn't have to rip the pool out. It was less expensive than relocating the pool. So here's what we're going to do today, guys. We're going to break this down really into two separate sections. There's two separate things to learn today. Um, the first is, I want you to be the gatekeeper. I want you to become the gatekeeper for your client. And I decide the deal. The gatekeepers are actually to be able to say, I'm in charge of making sure any survey document that enters into the deal, from wherever it comes, that I know whether or not this document is acceptable to be part of a legal process that is a real estate transaction. And today, in the next 10, 15 minutes, you're going to learn how to say, yep, we can take that and submit it, or no, that is not a real document. That's not a legal document. That's not a survey plan. You're going to be, able, you're going to be armed with that information. But if you leave today with just that, you're way ahead of 99% of agents out there. Most agents, they say, give me a survey. They're given a document. <coughs> okay. They don't have the tools or the knowledge or the experience to be able to say, no, that's crap. We can't use this. Not a legal document. My client's in jeopardy if I accept this document and we use it. We make decisions based on it. So we're going to talk about how to do, how to identify an official survey plan and um, identify the different kinds of surveys that you can and cannot use in real estate. There are many different types of survey plans that surveyors create that you cannot use in real estate. We'll go through those. Then we'll get into the second part, which is how to read it. We're going to, we're going to look at six things. All you need to know how to identify a survey plan is six things. It's a six-part process. It takes five minutes. All you need. Because at the end of the day, we're not asking you to become survey experts. We're asking you to be the triage. When you go to the hospital, you don't get to see the doctor right away. You get to see the triage nurses. And the triage nurses will, will sit down, take the temperature, take the blood pressure, and all that stuff, and make a determination as to what that next step is, right? You're the triage nurses for the uh, uh, who do the boundaries. You're the ones who say, you know what, I suspect there's something serious here. Let's go talk to the survey. Or, you know what, we can deal with it this way, we can deal with it that way. That's all we're trying to get you armed um, with. Don't, be, don't think that we're going to try and make you surveyors out of this. Not the case. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about how to use it and start trouble and what to do when you're not sure. Fair enough? Is that what you're all here for? Yeah. I have to ask that. One time, two people walked out saying, this is a selling seminar. What's the matter? I don't do selling seminars. Okay, so let's start off. Now, let's look at the documentation, first of all, that you have. Does everyone have uh, a package? Yeah? There's a couple of things you've got in here. First is my business card. We have a staff that during business hours is available for you to phone and ask questions. It's free. We're there to support you. Our business model, our, our end customer is always the homeowner. But we know that for us to be able to influence the homeowner, we have to have you on our side. We know that you are, our, from a pure business standpoint, you are our pathway in to our end client. So we want to work with agents who appreciate this stuff, who we help. Because we know if we can help you be better at safer and manage risk, we know that you'll return a lot eventually when you do need something related to what we do, hopefully you'll say, well, you should go with those guys. I learned something there, and we've got some good advice. We've called three times and they helped us. So please, the number's on the card. If after this seminar, you have, you have not remembered anything, because I'm such a horrible presenter, that you haven't remembered anything, but all you remember is, if there's a problem, I can send Chris an email with a plan. Just remember that. If you receive a plan and you're not sure, send me an email with that plan and say, Chris, yes, no. In other words, can I use it or can I not? 
you're not just sending an email saying, hey, we were at the seminar, it was really good, really enjoyed it, I think you offered this, would it be okay if I sent you a survey? No. Send me the plan in an email, yes, no. Okay? And I'll send you a reply, yes or no. It's that simple. We get dozens of these every day. Please use us. Okay? We've worked with you guys here at this agency, this brokerage, for five years on this stuff. So many of your colleagues in this brokerage use us. Please use us. First page number is, is this the first one? Somebody yeah, 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 two eight nine. That's probably yeah. The mobile is my mobile. Oh, Call me on my mobile if you like. But some people do Sundays. Hey, I'm just about no, 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 no. I'll take it Sunday. Um, bookmark. We're old school. I still love bookmarks. Um, search, click buy. This document here. Leave it for later. This just summarizes what we have to offer as a company, guys. Okay. Today, this seminar is these two documents right here. Okay. We have a really great survey plan of a, of, a, of a property on Old Young Street, south of here. And then we also have a cheat sheet. Everything we're going to learn today is on this cheat sheet. All right? This is gold. This is the gold, the golden ticket today. Uh, everything we're going to go through is summarized on here. So we're going to refer back to this a lot. All right? So step one. Oh my goodness. Really? You see, I have a Mac. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. Four, Four hours. hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So let's start off with how to identify an official survey plan. This on your cheat sheet is B. I don't know why it's not A. It's B on your cheat sheet. Okay. So how do I identify an official survey plan? So, I apologize for the quality of this, the, the way this looks on here, but good news, you've got your own copy of this plan in front of you. Okay? So, when you receive a survey plan, you're on the buying side, and the listing agent sends you a survey, or they've even attached a survey to the listing. Or maybe they haven't got a survey, and you come to us because you want to get a survey from this client, you want to make sure that everything's covered up. You come to us and you download a survey from our system, you buy a survey from our system. Or you're on the listing side, and the homeowner gives you a, your client gives you a survey. Where do you get it from the neighbors? Wherever you get it from. The first thing you should be doing is saying, no, this is not just a second this. I need to confirm that this is actually a survey plan that I can use for the transaction. So you're going to look for four things on the face of this plan. Four things you're going to look for that plan. Okay? The first is, in, the in, in this case, in the top right-hand corner, it's called the title box, right up there. So the title box, every survey plan has a title box. And that title box contains the locational attributes, the locational information of the properties being the property of properties being surveyed. It's not the address. It's the lot and the plan, or the parts of the lot and the plan, the lot and the concession, right? So in this case, you'll see that up there, in the top right, right up here, it says part of lot 123, 124, 125 on plan M. 459. Now, plan M459 is the plan of subdivision, and this survey is focused specifically on three lots, or parts of three lots, one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five. Okay? And so, the first thing you're looking for is that. Now, it may not, it may be up in the top right-hand corner, it may be in the middle, it may be top left, it may be anywhere on this document. Don't always look for it in that top right-hand corner. It could be anywhere. This particular survey, was done recently in AutoCAD. The survey's done before, what, 1995? And Android. But you're still looking for the evidence, oh, sorry, the evidence of that information. It will be hand-drawn, hand-written at the top. Parts, you know, survey plan of parts of lot 123, 124, 125, or plan, whatever, right? Hand-written. That's okay, as long as that information is there. <coughs> is this entire seminar without description? No, no, no. This information will be in the legal description. First of all, this may be a survey of three properties. Uh, lot 123, lot 24, and 125, right? In which case, no, it's not the legal description. No. It could be that this property is all three. In this case, it is. But this is just the first piece of the legal description, the location of the property. It doesn't show the easements, it doesn't show any of the other information, it's the legal description. 
But no, you can't go to the plan and just take this and say this is my neighborhood. It's just the location. Right? Okay, so the next thing you're looking for is the surveyor, the surveyor's name, signature, and the date on the plan. So in this case, uh, again, look at your copy, it's much better. Yeah. Down here, at the bottom, right there, right? And this particular plan, right down there. I'm talking to the right place, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay? You'll see that it says, You'll see that it says two things in there. It says the date, February 28, 2011. Okay? And it also says signature. That would be the survey's signature. Surveyors are strange people. I work with them every day. I love them. But they're strange people. The surveyor who gave me this particular plan refused to actually sign it. So I could never sign that. It's not a legal document. Right? Export that to them. Are they going to sign it? No, no, no. This is our survey, and I just want to give this out to you guys, right? I couldn't sign that. That makes this a legal document. It is a legal document. We did this, but no, my signature's not going on there. I didn't do the research. Can you just put an X or something? No, I'm going to write signature there. All right. So signature is where they would sign it. You see a survey of signature, right? And below that, you'll see it. It'll say the name, and it'll say OLS, or Ontario Land Surveyor. This is critical, guys. This is absolutely critical. Every survey plan that you accept has to have both the date and the surveyor's signature on it. Because this is a legal contract. Don't think of this as a drawing, a picture. Think of it as a legal contract. And as you guys well know, think of you've got a 10 page legal contract, right? If it isn't signed, is it valid? No, it's not valid. Same with the survey. If it isn't dated, is it valid? It's not valid. Same with the survey. If your survey is missing the surveyor's signature and the date, you cannot accept it because there's a good reason for it. When these surveys are produced, the surveyor in charge of the project communicates back and forth with his drafts people and his field crews who did all the measurements and took all the dimensions and everything. Three, four, ten, twenty times sometimes. And they produce the plan and he goes, no, I don't like this, move compared to this, go recheck this number, I don't think it's quite right, maybe there's a mistake here. Uh, you know what, the client's really interested in this, go take a few more measurements back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So there are a ton of these out there in an office that don't have signatures and dates on them. There are very few, one, that is signed and dated. So you have to make sure it has a date to see what you want to. Yeah. Maybe because, as you said, it's a legal document, so it should have six essential elements. One of them is offering acceptance. And there is no signature that means it's not accepted. So this right. element is missing, so it's... That's right. It's the survey doesn't, it doesn't represent the survey's opinion. Right. Question two. Yeah. That happens a lot. You get yeah. survey outside the more more yeah. or the old yeah. date. Yeah. What happens more what happens more often is what we're going to talk about in a minute, which is agents agents photocopy just a piece of it. And listen. Occasionally, maybe one one in fifty times. We'll find an agent, we'll get an agent who's got a survey plan that doesn't have a date on it, or it doesn't have a signature on it. Somehow they got they got slipped a draft copy and then they took that and ran with it and worked with it. A draft that wasn't signed, right? So you're gonna look always for the survey date and signature. Now again, if this is an older plan that was hand drawn, it was hand drawn and hand written, usually the surveyor's name and their signature and the date is usually at the top, like a title. You used to write them like letters, right? You used to be all the way at the top. So don't get stuck on where this is on this particular plan. Get stuck on looking for the evidence that these features. Okay? Next, the survey firm. I do not expect you to learn all the survey companies in GTA. Not at all. What I do expect you to do is look at that name and see if it screams, we are not a survey firm. If it says Smith and Smith, and Smith Landscapers, Smith and Smith Landscape Design, Jones and Smith Architects, Bill and Bob's Engineering Firm. These are not survey firms. They do not have surveys. Some engineering firms do, but that's a different thing. If it, if it specifically says that it's not a survey firm, question it. Because architectural drawings look very much like survey plans. In fact, they're based on survey plans. But architectural drawings are not surveys. It's not signed by an architect. Site plans. 
are not surveys done by surveys, they're done by planets. You cannot use those in a, in a real estate transaction. So just keep an eye on that one down there, okay? And then the last one is the association sticker. And this is something we're going to look for, but sometimes it's not going to exist. The association sticker is literally a roll of stickers that we have in the front of our office. Each one of these is a numerical sequence, each one is unique. And this is all part of control and quality and distribution of plans. What this does is it allows us, when we finally finish the plan, the survey is signed and dated it. The surveyor puts a sticker on it, takes a sticker, sticks it on it, embosses it, right? And then this gets scanned as the final original plan. Now that started in the early 90s with that system. So look at the date. If it's newer than early 1990s, you should look for the sticker. If it's 2010, look for that sticker. If the sticker's not there, you can't accept this plan. Nope. Which date is not valid? It's not valid. Which date? Early 1990s, between 1990 and 1992. Somewhere in there. And again, if you're unsure, send an email. Yes, no. Okay? It's the yes, no email. Send it to me. What's the importance of the sticker? The sticker, the sticker allows a surveyor. It's another way of the surveyor proving that this is his or her final opinion on the boundary. Without the sticker, you can forge stuff. Right? You can take a draft plan that isn't signed and dated, forge it, who's going to know? That's it. But how can you cause them to 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 cause So, to cause them 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 to cause Always these three things. And if you're unsure, send me the yes no email. Okay? After 1990, you add a fourth element to what you're looking for. The sticker. Okay? okay. That's, right. That's B on your cheat sheet. So in this particular case, one of the things that you'll notice is right at the top there, in the title box. Yes. You said that post-1990. So anything prior to 1990, what does it have? No sticker. No sticker. No sticker. No sticker. No sticker. No Correct. Uh, it will be embossed, but you won't oh. see that on a photocopy, okay. right? If you have the original, you see it, but yeah. usually it's all PDFs now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So one more important thing to take a look at, which takes us into the next piece, and that is, if you look closely at the title box, you'll notice that at the very top, above the location of the component, it says, what does it say? Can you see it? This case, surveyor's real property. There you go, surveyor's real property report. Okay. That tells you the type of plan that this is. There are literally dozens of different types of survey plans. That always tells you the type of plan. In this case, this is a survey as well property report. Get used to that as being the gold standard for real estate. It is the best type of survey to use in a real estate transaction. In fact, it's a standard that was developed specifically for a real estate transaction by the survey, by the survey community. So always look above that tiny, that tiny box at the very top for the type, type of plan. And in a minute you'll see why that's so important. But in this case, with this plan that we're looking at right here, it's a survey as real property report. Sometimes that's called a plan of survey. Sometimes if it's older, it's called a building location survey. We'll get to this in just a second. But that's where you see the type of plan. And then here you can see the survey was completed on February 22nd, 2011. Okay? The date's really important because Whenever you attach a plan to a listing, or whenever you get a plan for your land that you're building that's on the buying side, you always have to caveat your thoughts and your assumptions and your conclusions with, this is the state of the land and the boundaries on this date. It's like a photograph. You can't take a photograph from, of the property on February 22, 2011 and say, well, that's how it is right now, right? If this is a 25-year-old plan, and the fence on that plan is off the boundary, you can't immediately assume that 25 years later, the fence you see today is in the same location off the boundary. If it's a six-month-old plan, yeah, there's a good chance it is the same fence. Maybe not, maybe yes. These are the questions you go through. Right? You've got to caveat everything you do with the date. So let's talk now about what survey plans you can use out of all the different types of surveys that, 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 uh, that exist out there. By the way, this is another example of what a surveyor's real property report looks like. It's dense, dense with great information. Buildings, structures, fences, measurements, everything that you need in order to be able to look at that property. What is it called? It's a surveyor's real property report. 
Still is on our survey, still is on time. Yeah. Sorry? So still we have we are we are uh, proper to report, but more than only one building. Yes, you can. Everything else. Oh, that, no, that's the, that's the that's the that's the register plan. That's the end plan. We we'll get to that in a second. That's the okay. end plan. Yeah. So if this is our plan, no, so this that is not our plan. We don't say uh, we are part we are a property report as our plan. No. That's what we Two have studied plans. in books. Two separate. We call it our plan. Two separate. Oh my goodness. We'll show you. Yeah. The stuff you've been taught. Mm -hmm. Listen carefully. Okay. Okay. Um, so when we're looking at the type of plan, right, the type of plan, the type of plan, if you see in the title box up here, if it says survey as real property report, if this says plan of survey or building location survey, gold, because all three of those types indicate that this isn't just a survey of boundaries, but it also includes the buildings, the structures, the features, not topography, but the features like the fences, the decks, um, anything physical that's being built, sheds, pools, patios, right? Anything physical that's being that's being uh, built, and its relationship to the boundary. It's always about relationship to the boundary. In actual fact, even though we care about the physical features, what surveyors care about is the boundary. And the only reason surveyors put that stuff is to say the building is this far from the boundary. You're looking at it going, how far is the boundary from the building? Surveyors don't care. Here's the boundary. The building is this far away, the pool is this far away, the shed is this far away. But those measurements work both ways to you. So plans you can sometimes use. This is where we get into the R plans and stuff, right? Subdivision plans. You guys are all familiar and comfortable with subdivision plans. Yeah, you use them sometimes, the end plans. What do you see on a subdivision plan? When you open up a subdivision plan, what do you see? What does it show? Anyone? In subdivision plan, you see the, uh, the plan of what happens in one building. So yeah. There are 10, 12. Houses. More than one, so yes. What else? We usually use it when we have one property, we don't have survey for that, so we knock the next door and we ask them to give us the end plan because mm -hmm. usually the death or something can help us. You're confusing two different types of plan. You're almost so close to being right, just off though. You'll be right by the end of this, okay? What does an end plan, what is a, what is a plan of subdivision not show us? End plan. The building by the building. Buildings. They don't show buildings. Buildings. Or they show you the boundary and the road. Yeah. Boundaries, roads. Why do they not show buildings? Because that's before they even do it. Yes! Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. This is the thing. It took me a while to get. I'm not a survey, but I'm a tech guy. I had to learn all this. I only know a little more than you do, maybe. Maybe some of you know more than I do, but um, I shouldn't have said that, should I? Um, the truth of the matter is this. Subdivision plans are the, are the plan that is submitted to the city. When a developer buys a piece of farmland or a big piece of land, it's still a cornfield, and goes to the city and says, I want permission to turn this one big lot into 150 small lots with these roads and these features and everything else. May I have permission to do this? And they go back and forth with the city, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually the city says, yes, we approve this. And the second they approve it, what the city does is says, this area of land is now no longer known as Lot 5 of Concession 3, is what it used to be called. That name is erased. This area of land is now called Plan 65N12345, or it's older Plan 765, or Plan N. So many different ways of saying it. But it's a subdivision plan. And it gets a new stamp up in the corner from the city that says, yes, we've approved this, and we've renamed it that. OK? That now becomes the blueprint for the developer to go build. The developer now has to go build within those boundaries. Nothing's being built, it's still a cornfield. So when you get the subdivision plan and you say, oh, I know, there's no houses on it, we're not going to refund you because we say to you right up front, no houses, no houses, no houses. This is why they don't have any houses on it, okay? It doesn't mean they're not useful. For the last resort, they can be useful. And our plans, reference plans, are very similar. Reference plans as well are used to subdivide land into smaller subdivisions. So if you've got a 150 foot lot, 100 foot wide lot, and you want to subdivide it into two build and build itself, you use an R plan to do that. There's a process for that. Okay? But again, R plans tend not to show the buildings. Okay? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Try and avoid them if you can. Use them as a last resort. 
but don't expect to be able to do the kind of boundary due diligence on the property you see today if you're looking at a subdivision plan or a reference plan. Okay? Because they typically do not show buildings. So when can you use them? You use them as a last resort. You use them as a last resort. You want to do boundary due so you're, you're, you're listing a property, you want to disclose as much as you can, you look everywhere, you can't find a survey as well as property report of any age for this property. You just can't find it. You come to us, you meet the neighbors, nobody can find you anything. Nothing still exists for that property. So what do you do? You don't do nothing for the subdivision plan. Because at least that confirms the shape and the size and the location of the lot. It doesn't give you any information about the buildings or the fences or the pools, but at least it confirms the lot. Yes. So how does it work when it says plan M for five men? Yeah. And so you see you see the building. Well, this isn't plan M459. This is a survey. The survey is real property report of Lots 123, 124, or 125 that are located on that plan. All right? So, so, down there, down there. Thank you. This is worth taking a small detour on, okay? So, you're the developer, you buy this acreage, right? This is, you know, 1.5 kilometers of one kilometer. Big, right? It's one lot. It's called lot three concession five. This whole thing is called lot three concession five. It's what's been known now for decades. You buy it, you go to the city and you say, I want to build a subdivision. You say to the city, here's what I want to do. I want to put a road in this way. That way, I'm going to do this. And then what I'm going to do is I want to go like this. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, four. Uh, really, I'm not a developer. High shapes like that, right? You do this. And then we say, we propose that we start with this as being lot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 101. We're going to do two, so on, right? That's what we're going to make them. The city eventually says, yes, you're good to go. Right? From that moment on, and the city says, from now on, this piece of land is renamed. Yeah. It's no longer lot three concession five. It's now plan. Let's call it this. M459. This area. Now called plan M459. Right? So, whenever you are dealing with this property, how do you refer to it? Lot six. Lot six, plan M459. This one, lot eight, 459. This one, 101, 459. Okay? This property over here, though, was interesting. Somebody did a big problem. But what they actually did is they were, they were actually. Three lots, one, two, five, one, two, six, and one, two, seven. Somebody bought all three lots. He was the builder, right? And he said, no, no. I am owning all of this one property. What is that property called? ABC? Not one, two, six, one, two, seven. One, two, three, one, two, five, one, two, six, one, two, seven. Of plan four, five, nine, and four, five, nine. If we as a survey company, you own this now. And you contract us to come and do a survey of this property because you want to add a pool or an addition or something. What would we call the survey? We would call it a survey as real property report, right? Of lots one, two, I know the number's wrong, sorry. One, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five. That identifies the property on plan M459. This is the naming of the property, right? When you sell this property, you're selling the, the, the lot and the plan naming of it. Does that answer the question? You guys got it? It's not rocket science, right? Okay, move along. Um, the golden rule is basically if you see on your plan that it's got buildings and structures, it's probably a great one to use because it gives you a depth of information that you're not going to get 
on the M plans and the R plans. The M plans is the subdivision plans, the R plans are the, the reference plans, right? So if they don't show buildings, but they're still a survey plan, use them as a last resort. Don't expect to be able to get a depth of those because they're not going to show buildings. Right? So in this case, it's a survey as real property report. It's got buildings on it, this one here. Um, this is a plan of subdivision. Now with this one, note that here is the uh, the legal the the, uh, the location of the uh, sorry the title box, parts of lot seven and nine concession six, right? And what's interesting about this is that the legal the I can call it the legal description. You've got me going on legal description. The title box here says this is parts of lot seven and nine concession six. So when they went to the city, they said we want to redevelop what is currently called. Lot three concession five. And this is what we want to do with it. So we we are looking parts of lot seven and nine of concession six, this whole thing. And we want to do something with it. And the city eventually came back and said, Yeah, we like it, do it. At that point, the city gave it its new name. In a box that's off the screen here. And that name would be 65M12345 or Plan M, whatever, and so on, right? It now gets its new name. But what's interesting about this is that if you zoom into this area, what we were saying, right? Lot dimensions, lot locations, lot numberings, and that's it, no buildings. There's nothing that you build, it's still a cornfield. Yes? 20 bucks later on. Thank you. So this is a reference plan. Yes? Is there any place or survey that shows us what type of registration is land type? No, not so. No, that's the parcel register. Good question, though. Um, so this is a reference plan. And this shows you up here. Your next, okay, one second. This shows you up here. This is the box that the city fills in to say yes, we approve this, and now here's this new name. Okay, that's what it looks like. So if you see a survey plan and it's got all the markings on it, right, and then up here you see the city's box. It says, yep, we've approved this, here's the signature, here's the date, and this is the new name for this land. Then you know it's either a reference plan or a register plan. Good question. Yeah. Um, so say you're buying vacant land from off of a developer's block of land that developed it, yep. and now it's on just the land no building. Yep. Is it acceptable to buy the lot without the survey, just off the subdivision plan? I would never buy a piece of land without a survey, ever. You can. There's no law that says you have to, unless yeah. unless it's being unless it's part of the process to being subdivided. Yeah. In which case the lawyer is going to want to know, and the, and the lender, if the lender is involved, they're going to know that have we confirmed the extent of title. Okay. So it's not legally required. Great question. It's not yeah. legally required. It's highly advisable. And if you've got a really good real estate lawyer involved, they will not let you go forward without that. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. So this is a reference. When you're subdividing a smaller yep. plot of land and then subdivisions for the larger, can they pick the registered plan? Which one did that one? It took me a year and a half. Okay. It took me a year and a half to get it. So, a registered plan is a plan of subdivision. So, it's another version of the plan of subdivision? It's another name for the same thing. It's another name. Oh. I'm so sorry that my industry uses <coughs> this stuff. Um, you don't get, you don't, don't get in the weeds on that. The purpose of what we're doing here is stay up at. Does it show buildings? Is it not show buildings? Okay, stay up there. If you want to go deeper, wow, no, just don't. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Yes. I was confused actually. I remember the book said all plans for service. So the book was correct. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I think we have to get to the end of the session. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah. Yes. So a reference plan is used to change the boundaries of a property. Right. Change boundaries of a property. If you're doing a huge subdivision thing, you'll go with a subdivision plan. But if you're at an easement, if you and I are neighbors and you've decided and I, and I accidentally built a piece of my property, my pool, over your property, and you now want to grant me an easement over that, our plan is the document that describes what we want to do that goes through the legal process that gets approved. It's the diagram. It's the diagrammatic representation of the intent. And when it gets approved, it goes on title. And it goes to the legal description. Okay. So whether it's an easement you're granting, whether it's the boundary that's being changed, whether you're severing a piece of land or combining two pieces of land, 
are the, the, the reference plan. Let's call it what it is. The reference plan is what is used. Okay? But reference plans like this one, this reference plan was used to take this large law and subdivide it into two, but add another part down the middle as a mutual access way for whatever reason. Uh, maybe the city required a roadway to go up between them because it's just too big, right? So say 20 years down the road, you bought this. And then somebody gives you, you now you want to sell that property. And you say, well, yeah, I've got a survey plan at this. And this is what you get. It doesn't show your building. It doesn't show your driveway. All it shows is the severance of the land. So from that perspective, it is valuable that it shows your law, but no building. Yes, it's a reference plan, something that's done uh, ahead of the, of the work or <coughs> Ahead, right? So it's it may not accurately reflect what the property status is. Well, it'll, it'll accurately reflect what was the was granted, right? right? And the thing is, it's not like a boundary is something that you pick up and move. The reference plan isn't going to show the buildings. Sorry, isn't going to show the intent of what they want to build. So it's not like they're saying, here's where we're going to put the building. That's a whole different process that architects get involved in the city. But this is just saying, in this particular example, this is what the boundary used to be when it was called, when it all had one name. And we just want to split it into parts one, part two, part three, with these specific dimensions. But it's still not to be approved before. I'm sorry? The reference plan is it done before? Before, before. Again, it's, it's, it's still have to be approved. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you can't just do it. Yeah. Usually, the mechanism for approving these through the municipality and their committee of adjustment. They're the ones that approve a minor variance. They're the ones that approve this kind of severance of land. They're the ones that approve easements, uh, the granting of easements. So you might still have a reference plan, but it was never approved. Well, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that is something to be aware of. It's a really good point. If you get a plan like this, this is complete. <laughs> it was never approved. Somebody asked permission, it wasn't granted. So you can't use it. This is why we say reference plan, subdivision plan, trust that one. Okay, let's move along. What can you not use? So the top, and this is I think still A on your cheat sheet, plans that you cannot use that are made by surveyors. These are types of survey plans. But you can't use them. Topographic. If it says topographic plan of, you don't use it. The boundaries are not confirmed. And all you really care about is extended title boundary. Topos do not have their boundaries confirmed. It's a cheap and easy way of getting a depiction of a property without having to pay for the work that goes into confirming boundaries. For you, it's not useful. Grading plans, same thing. Sketches of. Now, beware the word sketch. 1990 is a big date in survey. Not only is it the date that um, the sticker came in, that's something you need to remember, but it's also the time period in which the word sketch went from being a good word to a bad word. You'll see some old surveys from the 20s, the 50s, the 70s, the 80s that say sketch of survey showing. That's okay. That's what they used to be called back then. Old surveys, it's okay if they're called sketch of, providing that they have all the identified features. If it's newer than 1990 and it says sketch of, especially if it's very recent, if it's in the last 10, 15 years, and it's a sketch of, it's not a survey. That's how some surveyors, it's, not, it's actually not allowed anymore. It used to be allowed, but that's how some surveyors, again, got away with, got around charging the rates that were required. They had a client that didn't want to spend a lot of money. So instead of doing all the work to confirm the boundaries and put a legal opinion, they said, ah, it's just a sketch. And they called it a sketch. Beware the word sketch, send me an email, yes, no. Okay. Um, plans without identifying features. So yeah, if you've got a plan, And it's missing any of the four things that we talked about, send it back, send it back, send it back. If your client sends you a grading plan, right? It will say grading plan in the title box. Send it back. Do not feel pressure to accept it because they are sending you something. They don't know any different. They're sending you something that's incorrect. You ask for a survey plan. They're sending you a grading plan. They're sending you a top of. They're sending you a plan that's not signed or not dated. Okay, send it back. And the final one is unreadable or incomplete documents. How many of you have dealt with a plan that you know is from 
the 1950s. It's been through one too many fax machines. And you can't read the damn numbers. If you cannot read the smallest letters of numbers on that plan, send it back. It's like having a legal contract that's been through the fax machine a few too many times, and you can't quite read the words. Right? You can't use it. The words are everything. The numbers are everything. And by the same token, one, one of the things that happens today a lot is most agents, most people, have an HP or an Epson or a further um, printer scatter, right, or you have an office. You get a large plan like this. It's 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. You forgot to send the survey. Crap, what do I do? I need to get away. Well, what do I do? So you get this, right? And you put it on your flatbed scanner, and you scan it, 8 and a half by 11. And you're like, well, you know what? Which bit do I scan? Thank you. You know what? I'll scan the bit that's got the house on it. So you scan that. What have you cut off now? Sorry. <laughs> what have you cut off? The title box, the signature, and the date, and the survey form, and the sticker. It's useless. It's like taking the middle three pages of a contract and saying, is this okay? It's not okay. It's not okay. All right? So don't fall into that trap. It's not all right to do that. Yes? Or a prompt if we wanted to get the survey from the city and they didn't have that. Yes. I got a recommendation from a friend that you can go to one of those online websites and call That's us. Yeah. Protect so your boundaries. Is it okay yeah. to use those uh, information? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't come here to pitch our services, but protectyourboundaries.ca, you come to our website, we have the single largest database of survey plans for Ontario, both residential and commercial properties in Ontario. Type the address in. We'll show you. We've got everything and more. The city has, Geo Warehouse, everyone. We've got the whole, we've got the biggest collection of survey plans. And if we don't have it in our database, we have a $75 service. You pay 75 bucks, and we get a survey research expert to start making phone calls to the surveyors that they suspect might have done work, but that don't share their plans and databases. We can usually find you a survey plan. Okay? So, not. Not survey plans ever. Architectural drawings, engineering drawings, engineering plans, landscape drawings, and site plans. They're on your cheat sheet. Refer to your cheat sheet every single time you get a plan, okay? And just protect yourselves. There's a grading plan. You can't really see it on this projection very good, but up there it says grading plan of. Don't use it. Send it back. Be firm. Protect yourself and your client. Be firm. So let's talk about how to read a survey plan. Um, let's talk about how to read a survey plan. I'm going to go through six things. You can download this presentation on our website, by the way. Go to protectyourboundaries.ca. There's a big button in the middle of the page that says real estate professionals. Go in there. Pull the presentation here. So I want to show you six things to do every time you get a survey. It's so easy, guys. All right? So the first thing you're going to do, step one, is you're going to find the survey monuments. The monuments are the bits in the corner. Right? The monuments are the way surveyors mark, a sur mark the ground and a survey to demonstrate the corners of the property. Now, in real life, those survey monuments are usually, most of the time, the huge great iron bars. Iron bars that are either two feet long or four feet long that are an inch and a half square. They're iron, they're just they're heavy. They're really heavy. And when a surveyor marks the corner of a property, they will take that, he or she will take that iron bar, and they have to pound it into the ground so that the very top of the bar is three or four inches underground. They go all the way in. They're not intended for us or our clients to use, to interpret, to dig up, or if you live in an Italian neighborhood like I do, tomatoes. Use to. Tomatoes, yeah. The iron makes great tomatoes. It's fantastic, yeah. They're not intended for tomato plants, all right? It's actually illegal to tamper with those. People do, but it's illegal. Those exist for surveyors to say, listen, I did all this work, I did all this research. For the sake of the next survey who comes and survey in this area, I'm going to put something in the ground that they can just find with the metal detector to know that this is what I meant by that. It's the surveyors to talk to surveyors. Okay? On the plan, those monuments appear in a couple of ways. They either appear as a solid black box or a I don't know, is that a white box or an empty black box? Whatever you want to call it. A white box, right? Right there, you can see it there. It's on your plan as well. 
The difference between those two, you it means exactly the same thing. It means there's a bar in the ground. That's a monument. The difference is that if it's black, it means the surveyor is saying, I did my research, and through my research I determined that a previous surveyor planted a monument, that's what we say, planted a monument in the ground at this point. I am confirming that I found that monument in that place. That's what the black box means. White means either there was supposed to be one here and it's gone. But I suspect those great ones, tomatoes have something to do with it. Or it's rusted out, it's really old. Or it's now buried under concrete. Somebody's built a driveway over it. And I have decided to place a new bar here myself. So this is found, that is planted. That's the only difference. In either case, it's monumentation. In some so cases, do they physically pick up the bar and yeah. hammer and pound it down there? Try doing it in the middle of February. It's a miserable job. Yeah. Okay. Sledgehammer. Okay. Yeah. It's not pretty. <laughs> I always thought that it's something you know, sometimes they have a concrete use where they figure that not. See, this is why I love coming here. 20 bucks to you right there. Some cases it's not an iron bar in the ground. In some cases it's what's called a cut cross. Right? If it's concrete, or if it's a building and you can't get to it, something's being built. Somebody's done enormous great landscaping. They've got one of those enormous great boulders on their front lawn, and it happens to be right on the corner of the property, right? You know, obviously you're not going to come stop from the boulder, obviously, right? So what do you do? You do a cut cross. You don't do it right on there. You go a little further away, but you get the grinder out. It's a gr like a grinder, right? And you grind an X or a cross into either the curb or the sidewalk. Sometimes they do it not the, the curb or you know the base, the concrete base on which they put the electrical boxes? Sometimes you'll see cut crosses there. Usually it's in the curb. And on the survey plan, that's depicted as you see. That's all that means. But monuments are first. The second thing you're going to do is the boundaries and the dimensions. You're going to trace, you're going to find the thick dark line. You're going to get a highlighter and you're going to go all the way around. The boundary has to close. So, sorry, when you said CC, so where is it exactly? Is that uh, white square? Yep, right there. This so is the white square and then they say CC. So this, this, this is saying that that surveyor he himself did a cut cross. Because he found the bar here with his metal detector, but it was under cement or something, or under concrete. So he said, let me be safe. I'm just, while I'm here, I've got everything measured. So the next time around, I'm just going to do a cut cross over here, a little bit further over, it's a witness point, right? A little further over, one meter west. I'm going to do a cut cross on the curb. Okay? So the next thing you do is you're going to highlight the boundary. Found your monuments, you highlight the boundary of the property. It's always the thick dark line, and it's the line that has all the big measurements on it. And in this case, first of all, a boundary always is closed. It can't be an open ended boundary. It always has to come around. However many sides there are, it always has to come back to the beginning. Okay? The second thing is that every boundary has, has a measurement on it, a dimension. Right? And in this case, you're looking at 17.02. What's the scale? Face of your survey plan, and right here you'll see it says metric. This plan is in metric. Okay, 17.02 meters. Now, how many different units of measurement do you think there are? Two. Two. So what do we have? Meter. Material. Oh. Metric. There's one more. There's one more. You know what it is? Yeah. What's that? Arcadia. Nope. It's called decimal feet. It's called decimal feet, right? Six point five feet is decimal feet, which is six point six six feet six inches imperial, which is whatever it is in metric, right? So be careful when you're looking at these dimensions. You can always check. Don't assume you know what the dimension, what the what the unit of measurement is. If it's decimal feet and it says 6.5, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that that's 6 feet 5 inches. It's not. It's 6 feet 6 inches. It's 6 and a half feet. I had, a, I had a, an agent buy a plan off the, off the off site. He calls me screaming at me. Screaming at me. Screaming. Your plan's useless. It's a fake. It's a fake. It's a fraud. Give me my money back. He says, look at this measurement. 
It says six feet, 12 inches. Looking at it, like, dude, it doesn't. It says 6.12 feet. Come on. You were at my course. You learned this. 6.12 feet is different from 6 feet, 12 inches. Obviously, 6 feet, 12 inches is Makes sense? Decimal feet. What's the decimal feet? But there we go. So the third thing you're going to do is you're going to look for the buildings, the structures, and the, and the ties. Um, the building is always characterized as, on the map, as, as the foundation of the structure with all these the little hash marks on the inside. That's how, that's how you can tell a building. See that? Right there, and then next door as well. And here's why having a building on a survey plan is so important. Where there is a building, the surveyor has an immovable object from which he or she can give you measurements to a boundary. And so we are looking now at these things called ties. Off the corner of the buildings, off the corner of the sheds, between the fence and the boundary, you're going to see dozens and dozens and dozens of measurements, units of measurement. So in this case, on your plan that you have here, right at the front, we're zoomed in, what is the distance of the boundary from the front of the building here? You see that? 1.82 meters. Is this site back? What's that? Wasn't that the site back? No, that's the distance from that corner of the building to the boundary. That is a site back. Setback. Setback? Yes. Mm, no, setback is more zoning thing. Yeah. yeah, you can call it a setback. But strictly speaking, this is saying the boundary, if you want to know where the boundary is, measure 1.82 meters from the corner of the building. That's your boundary right there. It's clear as day on it. Setback is more about how, what's the minimum amount I have to, you can call it a setback. The building is set back 1.82 from the boundary. But don't call it a setback. Just say the boundary is 1.82 from this point on. A back corner is 1.8, 1.8, and 1.79. You've got your full measurements. You can trace out the boundary. Yes, always in meters you see, you see that thing? Or No, this could be 1.82 feet. It could be. So how would you? Well, we, well we, this is our plan here. We just looked at it and said it's in metric. Right? In metric. Right. In so this one. If it's in the metric, it's always in the metric. Everything, Everything on every yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I understand the question. So I'm sorry. Feet, I have another, another, another plan right. on my, my list. If it says it's in metric up here, every dimension of measurement up here is metric. Okay. If it says feet, everything is in feet. You're not going to get, you'll never get a mix of units of measurement on a plan. Okay? So, not only do you have the measurements from this house to the boundary, but just for safe measure, you have the measurements from the neighboring house to the boundary. And the neighboring house to the boundary. I gotta tell you, as a side note, it amazes me. It amazes me that they can install this giant piece of concrete. Like, think about what they do, right? They excavate the hole, they put in the footings, they put in the, what is it called? The, the right. um, foundation. Yeah. And they, they pour the concrete to the foundation. They let it dry. They fill in all the way around. And then the survey comes back and says, let me make sure you've got it in the right place. 1.82, 1.8, 1.8, 1.792, within a centimeter. It's crazy how they do that. I'm fascinated by this stuff. How you can take these huge things and get them built so precisely. It's concrete. It's, anyway. Excuse me. Sorry, yes. I think it's why we should to keep ourselves safe we should you should measure the other I'll tell you in a second. I'll tell you in a second. Yeah. No, it was just extra information. The question is why we should measure the other side. So we check. Right? The more the merrier, the more measurements, the more distances you have, the better. Right? Double check, triple check, or triple check. So with these, with these setbacks, this is now where you can say, I can now see where the boundary is. If this is the side of the building and this is the front corner. I can take my tape measure out from the top of the foundation, always the top of the foundation, and I can measure out 1.82 meters, and I can put something here. I can put a rock. I can put a piece of wood. I can put my, I, I wouldn't put my phone number, no, but whatever, right? I can put something there. I can go to the other end of the building, and I can do the same thing. Now I can walk out into the front of the driveway, into the street. And I can look down that imaginary line, because I can see my two points. I can look down my imaginary line, and I can ask myself, do I see anything crazy here? Is there a pool that goes over it? Is there a deck that goes over it? Does the fence do this? That's all you have to do. 
You don't have to go any further than that in your expertise. But to do that, and if you do that, you're doing more than 99% of agents do in boundary due diligence. This is the basic. Measure it out. Where is everything in relation to this? Because this is legal representation. The boundary, when this survey was done, and today, is 1.82 meters from here. And it doesn't matter if somebody's built a fence over here, over there, if they've built, it doesn't matter. That's where the boundary is. And you can have certainty in that. That gives you an enormous amount of knowledge now. The fourth thing you're going to look for is encroachments. This is not your survey. This is a property you need to solve. This is the back of the property here. This is the backyard. The road is up there somewhere, and the house is over here, right? The street's up there. Um, so you're looking for encroachments. Encroachments are things that shouldn't be on the boundary, but are. Okay? It's a physical feature that shouldn't be on the boundary that has been built on the boundary. In this case, there's the boundary in blue. Do you see that? You see that there's a, you see there's the monument back there, and we're looking for the thick dark line there and there. We highlight it so we can see what we're looking at. So right here we've got this brick and aluminum shed. Why do you think the survey is telling us what it's made of? Why are you telling us, this Mr. or Mrs. Survey, what, what this is made of? You probably need a permit for it. You probably need a permit for it. What else? Yeah. Yeah. How, how big of a crane you're going to need to smash it down, right? Yeah, it's brick and aluminum, guys. It ain't moving. This isn't one of those, you know, 799 Home Depot pick it up on a Smith Street and move it. Shares. This is not moving. And the fact that it's got the little hash marks on the inside means that this is a permanent physical structure. Right? So why is he telling us that? The reason he's telling us that is that right down here, you can see it, clear as day. Right? The back corner of this brick and aluminum shed is over the boundary. Well, how far over the boundary? I encourage you, when you go to survey plan and you're examining it, I tend to get overwhelmed when I look at the whole thing. There's so much information. I like to focus in on small areas. So I'm focusing in now on just this area here, because it's this area that I'm interested in to understand what the issue is. And if you see, there's a little leader arrow here that goes from that corner to this notation here. And this says, and by the way, our plan here is in metric. It says point zero point two one seven. SE. What do you think that means? That's right. That's right. It means that the boundary is 21.7 centimeters or 0.217 meters southeast of this particular of the corner of the shed. It's always where is the boundary compared to this point that I'm showing you. It's not the other way around. Right? But what it's telling you is that this is encroaching by 20, almost 22 centimeters. Is that a problem? No. The problem is always in the eye of the beholder, right? The size of the problem is in the eye of the beholder. But if your client is about to buy this property, they might want to know this. And they might still go ahead with it and go ahead with the purchase, but knowing this is interesting. If your client is buying this, and this is a much smaller yard, and you've got a bloody great shed there, you've got to know that this thing's 10 feet tall, encroaching on your property, and you've got a small yard. 30 by you know, 80, 30 by 100 yards, and you've got this in the corner of your property, you might want to know that before you buy it. Especially given that, as we go to the next one, fences, hedges, and walls. Fences, hedges, and walls should be on the property line. Can anyone hazard a guess as to what percentage of, what percentage of fences in the GTA are not on the boundary? Percentages? 60. 60? 30? 30? 30? 30? 90? 90? Who said 99? Who laughed? It's 99 and a half. <laughs> you laughed. <laughs> 99 and a half, yeah. Over 99% of fences. The majority of fences in the GTA are not on the property line. Now, some of them are off by a couple of centimeters, a few inches. But very rarely do you find a fence right on. At least half of those are way off the property line. And so this is what that looks like. Again, there's the boundary. There's a hedge. There's a fence inside it. So what these people do, you can tell a lot about what people did here. Um, I'm half Greek. Any Greeks in the world? Great. So um, I, I bet you they're Greeks. This, this is my genetic heritage. 
I gotta build the shed back there. Quit nagging me, will you, woman? Quit nagging me. I'll build. Finally, I'll build the shed. I'm gonna watch Sunrise. Come on, let me work. I'll build the shed. I build the shed. It's not because I don't want to build the shed, so I just build it. I don't. So I build it, and then I have to build the fence. So where am I gonna build the fence? I'm gonna build it in line with where I built the shed. Right? That orange line is the fence. With absolutely no consideration for where the boundary is. It starts off the corner of the shed, bisects there, and carries on by verging after that. Same thing on that side. Look at this down here. The surveyor actually told us this fence is 89 centimeters off. Yes? So. It's not just Greeks. No, no, it's, it's a general idea. I had farmland in Hudson Valley, and I, I, I was concerned. All right. Let me get through this. We'll talk about adverse possession. Good. Good important point. Is that good with everyone? All right. So again, mistakes. And if we zoom out, you can see how this madness proliferates. Right. This is that fence. It cuts all the way down here. It continues down there under the hedge. And if you look at the front of this property, what do you see in the road? You see a house, a shed, a hedge, stairs, fence, shed, right? It's all done at beautiful right angles. But it's off from the boundary because the boundary is there. So what does this mean? Your client is buying this property. They get this survey. They go, wow, this is our land in here. We thought the boundary was where the hedge was. It's not. It's two meters further over. Great. Let's push out to it. What do you think this fellow's going to say? Whoa, what are you doing? That's my landscaping. You can't do that. The boundary's where the hedge was. No, it's not. Boundary dispute. Your client's buying this property. This is an actual fact. Gorgeous landscaping holds me. Beautiful, expensive, professionally done landscaping. They buy this property. They move in. A week later, this owner comes over and says, I'm reclaiming my land. Whoa, whoa, what do you mean you're reclaiming my land? It's my landscaping. No, no, no. You're on my property. Then why didn't you do it with this sooner? Why did you wait till now? Oh, because old Bob, who you bought from, they're old family friends. I didn't want to bug him about it. But you? I don't know you. Give me my land back. <laughs> that is the number one way family disputes happen, following a real estate transaction. Somebody wanted to wait to go out to somebody they didn't know. Right? Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, number six, the last one, easements. Easements. Easements and right of ways. Well, right of ways are a type of easement. It comes at seven or six, yes. Question about the front of the house. I don't know exactly you explain about the front of the house. What about it? How did you find the number? How do you find the number of the front of the the depth? That is a really that is a really good question. The number of the house, do you want to know the address? You know the number of the house. Oh. The, the depth of the how and you how long is the depth of oh, the house. Oh sorry, you look at the dimensions on here. No, no, I know but how do you calculate it from where? From mm -hmm. the sidewalk, from the sand, from the can't. water. Yes, you can't. You can't. And the reason is that the front boundary of the house, you can't see it. It's not the sidewalk, it's not the curb, it's not the boulevard. It's somewhere behind the water shut off valve. On the water shut that, the water shut off valve, the oh, driveway right. on the grass in the front, that's usually on city property. The boundary is usually somewhere behind that. Oh, oh, no, no, no. It's 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 I was told the right on the boundary. Yeah. Yes. That's too precise. Okay, if somebody hire you to the salary, yeah. how do you measure it? Oh, is no, the surveyors? Yes. We have all the crazy equipment. Okay. What do you is the boundary in the front of the house? Is the water of the house? It's wherever it is. I'm sorry to say it. I'm not being I'm not being like intentionally like obtuse on this. The boundary is where the boundary is. We can tell you where that boundary is. There's nothing physically on the ground that you can look at and say the boundary is always here. The boundary is always at the shut off valve. It's not. The shut off valve is usually just on city property. It's usually somewhere just behind that, but not always. Those things are those things are fluid, right? The only way you can know where the front of that property actually is 
is to get a survey and come and stake it out for you. Yes, that's the same concept. Stake it out, monument it, stake it out. I actually show you on the ground where it is. That's 800 bucks. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do. So, so how come we don't see that in the new subdivision, they already stake, right? If they have a server, it does show that. You see the wooden sticks, right? Yeah. yeah. How many times do you think those wooden sticks will be used? <laughs> so they don't put dirt, grass. So they, they, don't, they don't always put those iron ones. Yeah. So, yeah, so what they do is that in, in residential survey, you are required to put iron bars in the two front corners of the property. Residentially, you're not required to move them to the back. You're always in front. So they are there in the front. They are, but there's a snag in that. Developers didn't want to pay for that, so the law got changed. So you have to do two out of three. So some properties only have one. But that's all the survey needs. And again, you shouldn't be saying, I found the bar, that's my property line. What if it's a witness point? Oh. Right? You cannot do that yourself, not you, your clients cannot do that themselves. If you want to get a legal opinion, go to a lawyer on something. You're not going to represent, represent yourself in court. If you want to get, find out what your boundary is, you've got to go to a survey. It's not the survey. It's not all the encroachment. Yep. As a real estate agent, I know there's a type of insurance that covers if you want to. And as a real estate agent, when I see that, what am I supposed to do? Um, I'm my client, of course, but how can you solve that issue? So, let me finish this slide. That's the next slide. See, you guys are great. Where the heck? What's that? Tell me that. Please, 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 please. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't know if there's an easement on a property. How do you know if there's an easement on a property you're going to subject to? Legal description subject to ST together with ST together with right? Where do you find that information? Uh, I'm not where do you find that? Description. Where do you get the legal description? Geo, where? Impact. Impact. Don't go impact. Impact is the assessment of the legal description. You can buy it. You can buy it. Always go to Geo. Always go to Geo. They're the source. Come to us. If you've got to protect your boundaries, we're going to teach you now. You go and type your address in on our home page, and we say, if you want to go to the property page, go to the property page. That is a page that we created just for that property. With everything that we have for that property, surveys, sellers' reports, buyers' reports. So, so you can create it? The company? Yep. And not only that, right at the top, we tell you how many easements are on that property. You haven't paid anything for it. Okay. Okay. Um, your website or general warehouse? Our website. Well, Geo Warehouse is our partner. How much do you charge for that? To tell you how many? Nothing. It's free. It's right there on the page. What's the name of the page? It's called a property page, but go to protectyourboundaries.ca. Okay, you only talk but, about, tell us the number of these. But then you buy, you buy the seller's report or the buyer's report for like 100 bucks, and we get you all that documentation. The parcel register, which is where you get the legal description from every time. You don't trust the last listing. You don't copy and paste your your warehouse. You can't prove your judgment. You did that without making a mistake. You have to have the document. We'll get you that document, we'll get you the easement documents, we'll get you all that documentation, and we will interpret it for you for 100 bucks. So you can go, oh, that's beautiful. So the sales base is included $100? The, if you buy the seller's report, the subdivision plan is. Not the survey. No, the survey is 300 bucks. I can't give you that inside of 100 bucks. That's the same And you don't always need it either. There are some cases where you don't need a survey. So we're not going to force it on you. Okay? Easements, nothing is going to kill your deal like an easement. Please be aware of easements. If you suspect there's a mutual driveway, yes, get the survey. Because only the survey shows you exactly where it is relative to the house. So just like before, we had the buildings and the distances from the buildings to the boundary. With easements, the survey plan is going to show you exactly where the edges of the easements are relative to the boundary of the buildings. So you can look at it and you can say, is everyone using this easement the way they're supposed to? Yes, they acknowledge that it exists. Are they, actually, are they actually using it the way they're supposed to? Again, you don't want your client buying into a situation where that's not the case. You certainly don't want to be representing an easement correctly. Because that gives your buyer, who this is, a, this is the number one reason why clients get out of deals, your buyer who is now committed to the deal, they signed the APS, they're committed, their financing falls through. If they've got a good lawyer, that lawyer's going to go through and find anything they can that they can claim as misrepresentation to get their client out of the deal. You did nothing wrong. 
but that's how they get out of the deal. Easements is the number one way that that happens. So, how to use a survey plan to spot trouble? To answer your question, you're going to do two things. We've got like three slides left. Okay, guys? You're going to do three th two things. The first thing you think is you're going to study the plan. You're going to do the six things we just talked about. Okay? You're going to you're going to ask yourself, is this a real survey plan? Does it have all the identifying features? Can I use it? Is it for the right copy? Right? Yes, no. Then you're going to trace the boundary. Then you're going to identify which end of the street the street is. I often get the wrong end, so I'm, that's for me personally. Um, you're going to identify the fences and the hedges that are off the boundary. Right? You're going to look for those, for those features, and you're going to look for encroachments. And you're going to look for situations where, on the plan, it's evident that at that date, somebody was using somebody else's land in a way that is considered an encroachment. You're looking for easements and right of ways. Does it appear on the plan that everyone's using these the way they want? Or does somebody build a fence line to feed into it? Okay? And then finally, you're going to look for encroachments on city land and roads out front, usually. Is somebody going to build a porch with this massive stairway on the city property? That could be an issue in the future. Cities probably usually don't go after people for that, but you are encroaching on city property, yes. Is that between that line where the, the, the property line is and where the city line is? No. You can find the sides easily. You can find the sides. But you cannot tell. You, you guys, I personally, you cannot tell where the front is. It's very difficult. The only way that that happens ever, some survey plans like this one here, you'll see. Not only does this one, not only does this one have measurements to the boundary to the side, it also has measurements to the front. So you can measure from the house forwards on this one. Don't get used to that. Most surveys don't show that. This is a, this would be a custom request from this client. Most surveys, most surveys don't show the front time. But the thing is that part of that front is for the city. Yeah. To the city. Okay. There is no way we can find out how far. You get a survey to stake it out for you. You've got to get a survey to stake it out for you and show you. Yeah. Okay? So part one, study the survey plan, make notes, mark it up. Put big red circles around the things that you think you need to take a look at. Then go and walk the land, right? You've got the measurements off the side. Go and approximate where those boundaries are. I told you how to do it before. Rock here, rock there, look down the line, what do you see? Is the fence on the line? The fence today. Is it on the line? Do you suspect any encroachments? Are there any neighboring structures encroaching on the property? Come to two seminars from now for title insurance. It's a really important one. There's one thing, there's actually a lot of things that title insurance doesn't cover, but one really important thing that title insurance doesn't cover is if neighboring features encroach on your property. Yeah. Title insurance doesn't cover that, ever. ever. So look for neighboring encroachments on your property. And such as? Decks, pools, like patios. Title insurance doesn't have a fence design. How about a tree? I'm okay. sorry, I'm shattering your illusions about how perfect title insurance is. How about a big tree? Uh, don't get into trees in the city of Toronto, you'll always lose. Just leave the tree alone. People plant oak trees, saplings, like an inch into the boundary on top of my property. What's it going to be 20 years from now? It's going to be like this, right? But the city of Toronto, you can't, don't even, we don't even get into trees. It's, it's complicated. Did you say title insurance won't cover these encroachments? Title insurance does not cover anything to do with fences. No. And title insurance doesn't cover anything to do with neighboring encroachments on your property. It does cover some encroachments of your property on neighboring lands. So if you buy a property that is encroaching on a neighboring land and that neighbor takes you to court over it, title insurance should depend you. Okay? Come to seven out three for that, okay? Um, approximate the right of way location. Is it clear? Is it obstructed? Is it encroached on? Are the people using it the way they want to? You go in, you see a mutual driveway, right? Where two people are sharing 10 or 12 feet of driveway. The boundaries down the middle. There's an easement by the side that they each share rights over. Where does it end? Where is, does that easement go all the way up to the brick? If it does, what's with the hockey net, the four bikes, and the garbage cans that are sitting on it? Because the number one rule of easements is you cannot block or obstruct an easement ever. That is not a rule that can ever be broken. So if your name, if your customer is buying, if your client is buying the next door property, and you can see obviously that they're using that easement and leaving stuff on it, 
They might have built a lean to shed. They might have put a massive great air conditioner on it. And do it. Ask the question. So to your point earlier on, what do you do? You stop and you ask the question. But you can't stop and ask the question with the selling side. And you certainly, if you're the listing agent, you can't stop and ask yourself after you've, after you've done the closing. This is all about doing it before, before you bid. Don't put a bid in with conditions on surveys. It's a waste of time. Do your due diligence beforehand. Know what you need to know before you're going into it. That's, that's sort of the, the, the suggestion in all of this. Draw your conclusions. If you're on the selling side, if you're listing, what is my client trying to get me to sell? It's like the big, the big dark watermark on the ceiling of the kitchen. You know the bathtub is just above. And you're like, what is this? And you're like, what? I don't see it. Oh, it's just the paint. It's not the paint. The bathtub leaks. Did you fix it? How did you get it done? Be suspicious, especially with boundaries. Because you can fix a bathtub and a ceiling for five, six grand. Boundaries issues, hundreds of thousands of dollars to run into. Does what they're claiming look clean? If not, should you disclose up front? This agency is very adamant. Disclose, disclose, disclose. Always disclose. Be clear about what you're selling. So that at a later date, you cannot be chased after the fact for non-disclosure. Should I walk away from this deal? You know, the, you know that customer, right? You know that customer where you're like, ah, my spidey senses are up. This is not worth the two and a half points I'm going to get out of this if I'm lucky. It's not worth it. I'm walking away. My most productive use of time here is to walk away from this one. On the buying side, start with the question, what is my client's intended use of land? What are they trusting me with? What decision are they, are they passing over to me that they don't want to take care of? What issues have I identified on the land, and how will these affect their use of land? What might they have to deal with? And what the land do I suspect any growth? Do I suspect any issues? What do you do next? If you're on the listing side, you get all the documentation, you get the seller's report from us at least. It's 120 bucks for the seller's report. It's the parcel register. It's all the easement instruments. It's every single legal document that's on title. Leads, charges. It's what the lawyer does right at the end. But by you getting it up front, in a protector boundaries package that looks like that looks like dynamite, but if you want, we can brand as yours as well, you're saying, I work with a company that's getting legal documentation for me. This is part of the listing. What it does is it pushes the onus of responsibility for research and due diligence on the buying side. And it protects you from being accused of non disclosure. So do what you can to disclose on the buying side. Don't take what your client tells you as gospel. Maybe they don't know if there are issues. But on the buying side, please consider doing more due diligence before the bid. Go in big clean. Do your boundary due diligence up front. Get a survey, measure things out, ask questions, ask us, and uh, keep yourself safe. That's it for the seminar, guys. If you want to hang around for adverse possession, we can talk for three minutes on that. Yeah. Want to do that? Yeah. All right, adverse possession, bonus round. <laughs> so, adverse possession, yes. Uh, question. Uh, you're listing corner property, usually the corner. How do you size the front? What do you say the front is just the one that is facing? Do you add these two holes? Or <laughs> that's a dangerous question for me to answer. It depends on the property. It depends. You take the length of the side that, that the street that it, it, it's named to. So if it's on King Street and Queen Street, if that's the corner that it's on, and the address is King Street, you take the side that is King Street. And if it's a curve, Corners. No, I, I mean, like it's rectangular. Yeah. The corner is the name, right? Yeah. You got to talk to your broker about how you represent so that. I would say a regular lot, approximately this C survey plan. That's what I would say. But I would reference a survey plan. I would don't own that number. If you if you don't reference something else, that number's on you. You get sued for that number if it's wrong. Reference someone else for it. Always. So that's just survey. Yeah. And say as per survey. Okay. So adverse possession, guys, real quick, because uh, you've got to get out of here, and i got to get out of here. So adverse possession. So the question is, the question is, my client owns a piece of property, and they've been using this piece of property, a chunk of the neighbor's property for 5, 50, 20, 7, you know, 6 and a half years. Do they own it? Can they claim it? And the answer is, maybe. Just 
see, we have somebody that even knows this stuff. So the answer is this. It depends. It all depends. It hinges on one date. The law of adverse possession, more commonly known as squatter's rights, is broken into two parts. The first part says, as of the date that a property is converted to the land title system, all properties used to be in the old registry system, and they were moved into the new land title system. It was an administrative move that gave properties in the land title site certain rights that they didn't have when they were in the registry site. That was the reason for the move. So every property has a date on which it was converted over. They're not all the same. And you can't tell when that date is unless you get the parcel register, part of our packages. But that parcel register has that date on it. So as of that date, from that date forward, you cannot claim adverse possession on that property. Now, so if that property was converted to land titles on January the 1st of 2000, and somebody today says, 12 years I've been using that piece of land, I can claim it. The answer is, you can't. It was converted before the time that you're saying you, you're, you're making your claim for. It was converted 17 years ago. You can't claim that wrong. Because at the, at the moment the property goes into the land titles, you can no longer claim adverse possession against it. You cannot steal land after that date. So the second part of the rule is, well, what happens before that date? And the answer is this. If you can prove continuous and uninterrupted use of that piece of land for a period of 10 years prior to the date of transfer, then you have a case. But let's take January 1st, 2001. Today, you would have to prove not just using that piece of land from today, 2017, back to 2000, but another 10 years previous to that. You would have to prove photographic evidence, video evidence, that you used that land since January the 1st, 1990. It's impossible. It's impossible. Because as the owner of the next door land, all you have to do is once in a while go over there once a year. Once every two years, once every five years, go over there and take a picture of yourself on that piece of land. The case is gone. The case is gone. It's continuous and uninterrupted use of land. It's almost impossible to claim. And when you look at the court cases that go through now, the number of court, the number of claimants, the number, the number of cases that go through in favor of the claimant are virtually zero. There's hardly any. The mechanism <laughs> does exist. But just remember, the rule is, as of the date of conversion to land titles, you can no longer claim adverse possession of the property. If you can prove continuous undropping use for 10 years prior to that date of conversion, you have a case. But good luck. That's the rule. Make sense? All right, guys, we're done. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Thank you so how much. much it cost to do a survey? A new survey? Two grand. 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 Because right now, if you're going into a private place, you don't have a survey service that say you have a fan or something. Well, you know what? You don't have to get a new survey in that case. You come to us, pay the 75 bucks, you can usually find one from one of the surveys that doesn't share them out properly. That's a lot cheaper than going and spending two grand on the new one. 75 bucks. 75 bucks, and we'll do a search for you. We'll come back and say, hey, we found one, it's with this guy, and we're selling it for 150 or 300. It doesn't include the cost of the actual yeah. buying the plan. Yeah. So I'm sure I have to get any of the service. Just reference plans and register plans. So I found a survey on one. Some yeah. of them are not So they get them they get them from a place the same place we do. We own okay. that company. And what we'd have to do is spend the last three years of about half a million dollars opening every single one and actually putting it on the right property. That's why they don't come up into your warehouse very well. So the easiest thing to do is go there, type an address in, and have a property page. Have a look at look. Take a look at the example of the easement report. Take a look at the seller's report, what we do, and what's in it. And open up the PDF sample and the buyer's report. Right. What kind of easement? Oh, if you buy one of those three reports, 
the greatest detail we go into is the Thanks, guys. I'm going to get out of the way. 